excellent burial choices. And uh, this is something that I know nothing about. Um, but one thing that I do know is, is that all of the discussions that we have on here on any end of life topic seem to be some of the deepest, most thought provoking discussions that I've ever been involved with. And I have to say, like when I first started doing these, you know, talking about death and end of life or just even planning uh, was something that was kind of difficult for me. And um, uh, but now that I've exercised that muscle, I actually look forward to it. It's sort of like when there is a discussion that intersects with end of life. And so um, I'd love to welcome our um, our our panel member Sherry Haber to the stage and um Sherry uh really excited to uh to have you today on a topic that I know nothing about and that's always the best topic um we're going to talk about you know green burial and funeral options but before we do let's get to know you a little bit better uh something that I actually learned about you yesterday is our host um uh oh jeez Susan Black, who was talking about um, her virtual travel platform, she's like, I'm neighbors with Sherry. Uh, you all live in the same uh, community there in New Jersey. Uh, that That's ironic that we somehow scheduled you all a day after each other. But, uh, but tell us a little bit, how did you get into this, you know, uh, career path of... Uh, green burials and just helping people with their um, end of life choices? Well, I had prior to getting into this business, I had a career in communications. And what I do now is really to provide information, educate people so that they could be empowered to know their options, be prepared and make a plan for their whenever death because it's going to happen. And if you're going to make a plan, you have to know all your options. And people don't want to think about it. So they don't know about all their options. They don't know about all the decisions. And you don't want to make a decision when there's a crisis. You want to do this when you have time, you're not stressed, you could be thoughtful, you could really assess what's most important to you, what's your, what are your values, and what do you want to have as part of your goodbye. The way you say, the way you live your life should be reflected in the way you say goodbye. And I love it. And I've got, um, uh, I, I just, I'm just sharing your website, the, your organization is the great goodbye. And I, I, I love your headline here. Death is inevitable, but it can be better if you think about it in advance. And, um, uh, and, and you serve as a, a coach to help people with this decision making and planning and 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 discussing these options that's that's wonderful we need more resources out there but um but today today we're going to learn about the sort of green and eco friendly options and um i think you've got a slide deck that you are going to kind of walk us through some of these options and i want to remind everybody that as sherry's loading that up um, that, uh, we have, um, the best part about these discussions is they are live and interactive. So if anything comes to your mind on this topic, as Sherry's talking, or perhaps you came to this discussion with a question ar already at hand, uh, feel free to drop those into chat or use Q and A, or when we open it up for discussion, you can raise your hand, but Sherry, what I'm going to do is duck behind the curtain here and uh, let you take it away. But feel free to take a couple of breaks and just check in with me. And if there's any questions or anything that's sort of come from the uh, the audience, I'll I'll make sure to to let you know. Okay. Well, great. Thank you. And thanks for inviting me to talk about green burial now not just because it's beautiful spring season, but as some of you may know, next Monday is Earth Day. And what better um, preparation for Earth Day to consider this facet of taking care of the Earth. So in talking about green burial, because it's not well known, people may think it's new. 
but it really is not. It, it's something that harkens back to the way we used to take care of our dead in America uh, prior to the Civil War. And not a lot of people will realize that there was a very big change brought with the Civil War. So let me just quickly go back in time and tell you about it, and then you'll understand how we got to where we are today. So during the Civil War, when the Northern soldiers, the Union soldiers died on the Southern battlefields, their bodies had to be brought North for burial. And they came up, the people came up with this embalming fluid to preserve the body so they could make the trip North for burial. Um, from that, it led to what the most dramatic uh, demonstration of what embalming could do was when Lincoln's own body was brought from DC to his home in Illinois. It was a 13 day train ride and yet his body, his corpse was preserved. So from that people wanted to have embalming for their loved ones, whether it's a local death or what have you. And all these you know, storefront embalmers uh, started and they were preying on vulnerable people. So the government stepped in and said, you have to be licensed, et cetera, et cetera. And that really gave birth to the funeral industry. So it made it that instead of having bodies prepared at home where they would maybe be buried in the backyard or in the church cemetery, et cetera, we had a funeral home. Dead bodies were no longer in the parlor at home, it went to the funeral parlor. And that really set us on the course that has been practiced till today. But look at the implications, the environmental implications, and that's where green burial came from because when people took stock of the economic, excuse me, the environmental tab of traditional burial, look at all this waste whether it's resources, whether it's um, you know energy to transport it or to make this equipment, and the toxicity of the embalming fluid, this is more than two Olympic-sized pools of toxins going into the ground. People started to rethink what, how they were taking care of their dead and um, looking for alternatives. And that really gave rise to green burial. Defined, simply defined, it's a way of caring for the dead with minimal environmental impact. And you can read the rest of the quote, but I attribute it to the Green Burial Council that I view as kind of the good housekeeping seal of approval for all things Green Burial. They certify funeral homes and cemeteries and such. So um, if their practices comport with what uh, is required, then you know you're working with someone who is gonna authentically provide those services. You could see their website there and just know that, as I said, it, green burial affects the body preparation done in the funeral home as well as burial itself. Um, the key thing is no embalming. And you should note that embalming is not legally required. So if you go into a funeral home and they make it like you have to, no, you don't. And they're gonna charge you, so you don't need that. Um, I'll go into slides that will show examples of these biodegradable uh, containers and such. You know, cemeteries will try to sell you that you have to have vaults and grave liners really don't. And some cemeteries don't require that at all. And then it gets into the uh, treatment of the land itself and the workers. But if you go on greenburialcouncil.org, there's a wealth of information. So let's just quickly look at some of these um, containers. You don't have to sacrifice aesthetics to be kind to the environment. Um, these are made of either untreated woods, like you see here on the right, or willow and, um, you know, um, willow and bamboo and other sustainable materials. In the center here, you see a biodegradable container for cremains, you know, cremated ash. And here is a beautiful um, sustainable wood urn for your fireplace, perhaps, or if you choose to bury it. But these are all 
gentler things to put in the earth if you do choose to bury afterward. So then that brings you to green cemeteries. When you go on the Green Burial Council, you'll see there's three different kinds of cemeteries. I'm not going to um, go into what the difference is, but just to be familiar, there's natural, which is 100% green practices, and you'll understand as you research. Or there's hybrid. A lot of times you'll see a historical cemetery that has devoted some land now to be for green burial. So you'll have both in the same cemetery, but in different sections. And then there's something called conservation land trust. And that's a very, um, you know, extreme kind of green burial, but it is, you know, something that totally blends in with the environment as in the surrounds and it's very beautiful. You should know that people who have um, their loved ones who have been buried in a green burial situation have said that because there's usually much more family involvement and connection with the earth and dust to dust and all that, that it really helps with the healing. As you can see on the left, instead of a mechanical um, lowering of the body, this done with straps and, and family can get involved. And it's a great, a better experience, I should say, for a lot of people. So people are looking very seriously at that because of all the waste and, and money and resources that we're pretty much just burying in landfills when we have these high polished caskets with metal trims and the, you know, the formaldehyde that's in the wood stain and everything that's just going into the earth. So this is burial. And before I show you some other alternatives, we have to talk about cremation because in America, you think it's a binary choice. You're either buried or you're cremated. And right now, cremation is more popular than any kind of burial, green or conventional. So people are doing it mostly because it's the least expensive, but some people did think that it's more environmentally friendly because you're not taking up space for a dead body. You're not throwing all the resources in the ground as I had just demonstrated so that they thought it is uh, um, a better way to go. But in fact, and I should tell you, it's over 50% uh, of people are getting cremated and it's expected by 2025 to be about 65% as a national average. In some states, I think Nevada, Hawaii, places where land is scarce, it's even higher, maybe 80% already. So that's what's being chosen, but there's an environmental cost to cremation as well because it takes a lot of energy to fire up, the ovens are called retorts. Um, so fossil fuel used to fire up the retorts, it releases toxins into the air from your fillings from your body lotion, if you had cancer, radiation treatment right before your death, all those emissions are not good for the environment. And it's the byproduct that you end up with is extremely high pH. So, you know, people think they're doing the land a favor if they take the cremains and just directly put it in the ground, but the plants don't really love it because of the high pH value. So, yeah, it's cheaper and it's also, it gives you smaller, you know, um, uh, byproduct that you could do many different things with. So people like it, but, um, you know, tattooing and making gemstones and the like, that's another conversation. But uh, as far as the environment, it is not really a good way to go. So, but because so many people are choosing it, you could still, once you have the ash, the byproduct, you could still do something green with it. Like on the left, you have an urn made from a gourd. So, you know, again, a, a more sustainable, environmentally friendly container. A lot of people like the idea of using it to plant mixed in with other uh, soil amendments to grow a tree. They like the idea of death begetting life. So, you can plant indoors, outdoors. Here's some examples on the left. And then there's companies who are purchasing 
uh, forests around the country. I think they started on the West Coast and now they have some in the Berkshires and other Eastern locations where the forest is already established, the trees are grown, you go around, you pick the tree you like, you pay for it, they put a plaque and they wait for you. And when you're just ash, it could be sprinkled around the base of the tree. And it's a beautiful setting for your family to visit you, you know, in the years thereafter. So people are um, considering that as well. Or again, if you've been cremated, you could be uh, set off into the sea. You have to go three nautical miles out, but there are companies off the coast of Florida, off the coast of New Jersey, even I'm sure in California, where your remains are put into a biodegradable uh, container. This is like a pillow pocket here and it's set off and it eventually dissolves and goes into the ocean. That's the first two on the left. On the right, you see something that is a memorial reef. Some people who are big water you know, enthusiasts, perhaps scuba, dive, scuba diving or snorkeling, like the idea of the memorial reefs because they encourage growth of coral reef, support marine life, et cetera. And if you do, if your family does scuba dive, they, you know, you get the GPS location, they'll know exactly where the reef, where your remains were mixed in. There's a plaque, as you see, and, um, you know, people like that idea. It gives them comfort. And that's what, you know, this is about also is what you feel is most important for your goodbye. So we've talked up until this point about fire cremation, because that's the only thing that's widely available. But there's something new. It's more gentle as you think about it. Some people don't like the idea of burning uh, his, for historical reasons, personal reasons, what have you. Uh, they don't like the idea of the fire, but also given what I said about the environmental impact gave rise to alkaline hydrolysis, which is really water cremation. There's no fire used. It's legal for animals in all 50 states. It's only starting to become legal in, right now it's 28 states, we'll see in a second. But the basis of water cremation is that it uses water that's heated and mix with a little bit of a solution that is found in a lot of personal care products. It goes into a chamber, I'll show you in a second, it's temperature, it's uh, you know moisture controlled and all the, uh, um, the climate that accelerates decomposition. And it, instead of taking you know months or years to decompose in the ground, and that's a whole body. If you want to have something where that you get to the ash to use, as we discussed, people are using ash in different ways. Um, some people are favoring alkaline hydrolysis. There's no emissions. You get wider ash at the end. So some people are making little stones and other things where the gray ash of fire is not as um, appealing as the white ash of water cremation. And if you do have a viewing or something where you're embalmed, it's not an issue. You'll still be able to have water cremation. So to have an idea of what it looks like, this is the chamber into which the body is placed as well as the water and um, the solution, as I said. And it takes six to eight hours at one temperature, like 300 degrees, and it'll take twice as long if you cut the heat. So, but, you know, you're dead. It's not like you're going to feel it. And the byproduct is sterile liquid. There's no DNA in it. And it's often donated for fertilizer, which gives some um, religions some problems. Maybe that's why it's um, taking a while to get a, a legislative approval in some states, but it is getting a lot more traction uh, on the West Coast, especially. What I found is a lot of these alternative methods, green or otherwise, uh, take hold in the West Coast. 
and then they slowly move east. So they're more progressive on the West Coast, I guess. Um, before I go on to another alternative green body disposition, um, well, actually, I should just show you the states. I'm sorry. Here you could see the 28 states where it's currently legal. But as I noted with an asterisk, legal doesn't mean available. And by available, it means that someone went into the business and you know, is open for you to come and have a conversation with them and see their facility and find out how much they cost and um, to make that choice. So there's 28 states so far. Um, okay, so before we go further, Steve, did anyone need clarification? On yeah, there, there's a few questions, but I really like this one because I um, I was thinking the same thing and, and um, uh, C. Conley says, with green burial, are fillings and other toxins and medical devices removed for first, or how are they handled so that they don't go into the environment? Okay, well, um, the good thing is, is that you, um, you don't have to, rem in fire cremation, you do. In um, these greener methods, you do not. So you could, um, they're more pristine afterward, The let's say an implant, so it could be recycled afterward and you also wouldn't face the surgery, you know, the, the person um, wouldn't have to, to have a surgery before this final disposition method. So it's a cost saving as well. Okay, um, and then uh, I like Lisa's note. She says, my friend was buried on Monday at a green burial site in Maryland. She was just wrapped in a shroud and everyone scattered flowers around her. It was beautiful. Um, so uh, this is great that uh, we've got um, folks that have uh, have shared this. Well, let, let me let you keep on going and then we'll get to additional questions uh, at the end. And, um, uh, oh, um, Okay, so now these are some, uh, okay, so, well, well, we'll get to the questions at the end. So keep on going. This is great, Sherry. It's fascinating. Okay, I just want to make one comment about the shroud. You saw I did have that in the container um, slide that I showed you. That was organic pea silk. By law, you don't have to be buried in a container, you know, in a box kind of container, casket, coffin. It's cemetery rules that will mandate that you be in the container. You know? Okay, it's just good to know it's not legally. Uh, it, you know, and <clears throat> I mean, when I'm talking to you about when you're talking about these things, you sort of realize that I guess a, a lot of these sort of practices in tradition are sort of it. There's a whole industry built around it. Um, do you ever sort of come into conflict with uh, industry folks or, you know, uh, funerals in, in your line of work where folks are sort of, um, do, you, do you ever face resistance in this area? Um, I haven't, <clears throat> personally, I know that um, in the middle of the country where there's a lot of casket manufacturers, they don't like a lot of these green burial methods because then it you know reduces the demand for their product. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, I've heard of that. I haven't personally experienced that. Um, the only resistance that I'm mindful of, and before I work with someone or speak to a group, I always, especially if it's a religious group, I make sure they're comfortable with me providing all the information. I'm not steering anyone toward anything. I'm trying to um, empower people by giving them the information. But for instance, Orthodox Jews don't want anyone to be cremated. And, you know, I always make sure they're comfortable with me talking about it. And if it's a 
client, I won't bring it up unless they do if they're orthodox. Mm -hmm. Those kind of sensitivities I am mindful of. Okay. Yeah, yeah. no, I think this is a, a sensitive topic and there's lots of tradition and religion and things like that uh, that can be involved. All right. Yeah. Let me let you keep on going here. Okay. So real fast, um, on the right, you see uh, Desmond Tutu, the archbishop, had who died in 20. 21, lived his life as an echo warrior. So he wanted his goodbye to reflect that commitment. And he was, um, he elected to have water cremation. On the left, and I, I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but Luke Perry was one of the first to try this thing called a mushroom soup. And if you go on Green Burial Council, they kind of poo poo it. I, I don't know. It was developed by this woman at MIT. And if you look at the suit, you see these white vine looking things. It's not decorations. They're kind of mushroom spores and, you know, fungi and mushrooms accelerate decomposition and they remove toxins and all that from the body so that <clears throat> there's less going, you know, into the ground. So it's commendable that he did it, but it's controversial about whether it's worthwhile. Okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me, the new kid on the block is something officially known as natural organic reduction, but the shorthand, as you see, is human composting. And the idea is, instead of ash, the byproduct is soil. And it is such that it does accelerate um, decomposition, like water cremation, but it it's, you know, so it's, um, faster than just having a body in the ground, but it takes two to three months. And it's a two-step process. It basically um, puts you in a vessel, which you'll see in a second, and that's, again, temperature controlled, and there's um, hay and other organic material that you're laying in, and there's aeration and all these things, and over time, the body is reduced to soil. But what you get is some is a process that it's incompatible with embalming, so you have to uh, make the decision in advance. To the earlier question, it's really easy for um, recycling implants because they'll just be left there. And it is something that began again in like Colorado. Actually, this began in Seattle and um, other place in Washington State and Oregon and then started moving east through Colorado. And surprisingly, but gratefully, in New York in 2022, they uh, passed legislation to make it legal. It's not yet available, but it's a lot, it's very gentle on the body. You end up as soil. So what could be you know, better for the earth than to add to the soil? So, and this is a shot of the the woman who pioneered this whole process named Katrina Spade had started a business called Recompose. You could see a beautiful explanation of the process and the environmental benefits at their website, which is recompose.life. So here you see on the left, it's kind of like a mausoleum, but instead of drawers that look like file cabinets and such. She has a wall of these vest vessels that you could see one open here and blown up on the right. So there's the body is naked under there. There's no casket or anything, but then it's covered in this organic material and slid into the vessel for the time that it takes to be in the vessel. And then it, the uh, body is pretty well decomposed at that point. The bones and the teeth will not be. So like regular cremation, you have to um, use equipment to grind it down. And then they add that ground material back into the soil and it provides nutrients and such. And it's part of the cubic yard of soil that the process um, creates. But again, very environmentally friendly. Families are given a little bit of soil if they want. And then um, the rest is often donated to a conservation land trust 
and it's very kind to the earth. So that's, as I said, it's only seven uh, states where it's legal, but it is getting more popular. As I was preparing for this presentation discussion, I learned about something new that's on the horizon. It's coming out of England, where they also are uh, more progressive about anticipating and planning and talking about death. Um, but it doesn't sound like it's available commercially yet, but something to watch for, and it's called organic dispersal. And it's similar to this human composting. The difference is, is rather than starting with hay and organic material, apparently the body is put into um, soil already. They have a engineered type soil that has all the um, microbiome colonies and such that will enhance decomposition. And you starts in the soil. There's no need for any um, grinding because the um, bones will decompose in this process. So it's only one step versus this human composting is two step to put it in the aeration and add the bones back, etc. This is all done in one step. And it's soil to soil, so the soil, they said, can be more readily recycled and whatever. I just found out about them a few days ago. So something to watch for to see if it happens. Okay, so this may be all very interesting to you, but you've already, you know, your family has been using a certain funeral home forever, perhaps, or you bought a, a plot somewhere and you're not going to go for some of these. It may not be legal in your state, available, what have you. But even with a traditional burial, you can, you know, green your goodbye, as we said at the top. So just say no to the embalming. You know, a funeral home will work with you um, with ice and different refrigeration and such as a way to do it and still have the ritual that you envision for your goodbye. Um, then when it comes to a casket, choose an eco-friendly container. And by the way, you don't have to buy it from the funeral home where they really you know, mark it up. Um, you can buy it on Amazon, Walmart, Craftsman in Vermont are making beautiful um, containers. There's some like fantasy, um, carpenters who are making things in different shapes. If you had, um, if you were a musician, they can make a guitar for you and those kind of things. And, you know, obviously untreated wood and the like, but um, you could choose an eco-friendly container as we had seen at the top. Uh, same with whatever you give out, even what you're wearing. If you're not gonna wear a shroud, but you're gonna wear, you know, closed, make sure it's organic cotton or silk or something that's biodegradable. If you really take it to the extreme, you can care that the hearse is a hybrid or an electric vehicle. You can care about the, the food served, that it's organic and the whole of it. Um, so there are some suggestions. And then there's an organization, the Home Funeral um, Alliance that is really goes back to, as I said, when people used to do a lot of this at home and involve the family and um, it's not for everyone, but it is um, very meaningful to people. And if you want guidance, check out their website. So as we were talking about, it comes down to what's most important to you and how you wanna be remembered, what kind of lasting memory you wanna leave. So think about it and think about how you lived your life and what that means for how you leave the earth. Because to give it great perspective, we didn't inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. So what are you doing to ensure what they inherit is something that is healthy and vibrant? And that's the overview. And you see my um, contact information on the bottom if anyone has questions. Great. I will make sure to share all your contact info. And then 
we've had a couple of requests. If would you be open to like sending me a PDF of the um, of the PowerPoint and I could load it up with the recording? Sure. Okay, great, great. Okay, uh, well, Cherry, this is amazing. Uh, I have had no idea, learned a lot. It's making me think differently about my own personal end of life plans. But the um, uh, let's jump into some of these questions here. Um, Elva was wondering, do you have any price comparisons on these various methods that you might share with us? Uh, or, or, you know, just, you know, how do people sort of budget and plan and, and price these things? Ironically, when you uh, when you were talking about Recompose, I went to their uh, website and um, uh, th they've got a very transparent pricing page on it where it um, uh, talks about the whole process and uh, where, where, yeah. Uh, where the recompose method is $7,000. But I thought it was really great that they have this payment plan with no finance charges or anything associated with it um, to hopefully, you know, meet all different budgets. Yeah, yeah. They, um, I, I, rather than quote, they're very transparent. So you could see for, and they're a full service funeral home at this point. They have an area that, People can gather for ceremony, et cetera. So they say their basic package is 7,000. There's some people I saw in Colorado that are using different equipment and charge less, and it takes a little longer. But I could um, plot the different disposition methods relative to each other to give you an idea of price. So right. as I said, cremation is the cheapest. There are some direct cremation people you could find online, it could be $500 to $1,000, very inexpensive. The, that's for fire cremation. Water cremation is a little bit more. It's more in the like the two to 3,000, 3,500, et cetera. Um, and then the uh, human composting, as we saw, is 7,000. So that comes higher than the water cremation. But in ground burial, you know, don't forget it's the funeral home costs, and then even if you have a plot, it's opening the grave, it's closing the grave, it's all this kind of stuff. It's over nine thousand dollars. So traditional, conventional burial is the most expensive, aside from all the other downsides that we went over. Okay, and then um, I know that, and and again. <laughs> You know, there might be somebody on this call that that does this. We hear a lot about prepaid, you know, funerals and things of that nature. Is this something that you, an area that you uh, are familiar with? And can you give us any insights on, you, you know, prepaid and, and things of that nature? There's a lot of discussion around it. Um, I, I'm on the board of the New Jersey Funeral Consumers Alliance, and they say don't prepay, but their reasons I don't know hold up. If you prepay, you want to make sure that that uh, payment that you made is transferable should you move out of state, and what assurances or an insurance do you have if the entity goes out of business? A lot of these are no longer, you know, funeral homes are no longer mom and pop. Uh, they're owned by big corporations. So mm -hmm. they probably ha do have, you know, places all over the country and enough financial backing where you don't lose your money. But you have to make sure of those kind of things. Some people um, just say have a trust or a bank account or such. And that's the way to go. Well, somebody, I don't know if they're on this call today, but I bumped into them and they saw that we were going to have a discussion on this topic. And she was, uh, I, I think what she was saying is, is that her, um, her loved one had prepaid for a burial, but then uh, changed their mind on how they wanted to be remembered to 
a cremation and they had already prepaid for the burial, but they were just going to, I think they were reaching out to the, the cemetery or, you know, trying to see if they could transfer it to somebody else. Um, okay. Evelyn has a question. What are the cost of green burials in the ground in a natural or a hybrid cemetery? Um, you can, I, she, you may want to just restate what you, if you had quoted a price range there. Yeah, um, I just, um, green burial is saving on money because you are not using a really expensive casket. There's a lot of things that you, the embalming step and all that are saving. So but you have to talk to the individual funeral home to get a quote. But it's I know from talking to a new um, hybrid cemetery that just designated a section to be green, that the opening and the closing and everything for the plots are much less money. So there is okay. a cost savings to be had, but it varies all over. So you just, you know, you have to ask the questions. And a lot of times you can't get that information over the phone which you really should be able to. And on the website, uh, that's a battle that uh, organizations are having, but you have to ask a lot of questions. All right, um, let's see. Okay, now Elva says, be aware of the difference between a direct cremation and a regular cremation. Often mortuaries will embalm a body that is to be cremated with all those chemicals that go up in the smokestack and contaminate the nearby ground. No embalming with with a direct cremation saves at least a thousand dollars for direct cremation. Mortuary will pick up the body, refrigerate it, um, and uh, and then um, return the cremains to the family in a heavy plastic bag or a cardboard box. Um, the, the pink sludge byproduct of alkaline hydrosis is washed down the drain into our municipal water supply. So um, Elva was sharing a few things. Could you elaborate on that? Like, was do you understand what Elva was sharing with us? Right. But what I wanted to say about the water cremation and the sludge is that that is sterile liquid. There's no DNA. So it's not your loved one going down the, you know, our bodies are primarily water. It's, you know, just sterile affluent. It's not uh, anything tied to the person really. Okay. Um, Terry uh, has a comment here. She says, I called Congressional Cemetery to ask about a green burial. And I was told I had to make an upfront payment of several thousand dollars to buy the plot. Um, so, um, Sherry, like you, you probably know a little bit of the inner workings of cemeteries. Um, what, what are your thoughts on, on that? With all these things, if you, you know, they have pre-need and at need, <laughs> at need, you can't shop around, you can't find out and, and start negotiating. I want this. I don't want that. You just, you need it right away. And that's when you're the most vulnerable. Um, if you pre-plan, you could start having conversations and do your research so that you find a good fit for what you're looking for. Okay. So like in Car Terry's case, she, let's say that, you know, her family, everybody is at congressional She's she knows this is where she or her loved one would like their remains to be. Um, that make might make sense to you know have a dialogue and make that upfront payment to guarantee that this is where I'm going to be and this is how it's going to happen. Because at need, uh, if it's in your in your documentation, it's sort of like I'd like to be you know, my remains to be at in a green burial at Congressional Cemetery, the family may arrive and now they're not in a negotiation point of view and there might not be a spot available, right? Right, right. So you, you do have to. And the other thing, a lot of people who may already have a grave or a funeral um, 
poem picked out or whatever, say, oh, I already have that stuff and everything else I'll leave to my kids. I don't want to micromanage. But you know what? When your kids are bereaved and through their grief have to make so many different decisions, you're not doing them any favors. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't pay up front, if you at least work it out as to what you want, write it down, have a conversation with them so they know what you want. And if there's any resistance, you can iron it out then. Then when the time comes, they're going to be sad. Loss is sad, but they won't be stressed. It's a real gift to your loved ones. No. And and I think this is, a, I, 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 we've got more questions. I'm going to get to them, but I, I want to, um, I'm, I'm fascinated by your business. So basically the the uh my great goodbye this is overwhelming i mean in in the amount of information like in things that you you even said you just learned about this you've got your finger on the pulse of what's going on out there so folks hire you um either at need or pre-need to kind of uh map this out and and you're sort of a a quarterback in this this is that is that sort of the um, the role that you play? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I say I'm a better death guide and planner because people are are you know averse to thinking about this and researching. This is wasn't rocket science. I was doing a project about baby boomers, and I thought <clears throat> baby boomers are living aging differently. I wonder if they're dying differently. And then when I started researching it, I was blown away how much there is but people don't know about it because they don't want to deal with it. I get it. But you make it worse. You know, it's it's part of the circle of life. You don't just, you know, births, deaths, wedding. You don't just show up and think everything's going to fall into place. You anticipate and plan. But, you know, people don't do that enough for their death. And there, there's all these movements and efforts, death positivity, talk about it. It's like a mental dress rehearsal to think about it. And then you could prepare. So yeah, there's a lot there. People don't want to know about it. That's fine. Kind of tell me what you're interested. I'll yeah. Tell and I think that, you know, um, memorials and burials and funerals, they're things that a lot of us, it, it's difficult for a lot of us. I, I again, have found that um, I miss the people that I'm remembering at these events, but I found that it's been, they're one of the best places of personal reflection where when I'm sitting there and, and listening to the services, I'm also sort of reflecting on how I want to live my life and, and, and how I want to remember. So I, I found that I, I kind of look forward to these events um, not that I want to lose friends, but we're all going to be gone. So it's inevitable, you know, uh, but the um, Elva, I like Elva's comment. Elva gets the gold star today because she's been sharing so many great resources. She says, I met the owner of a green cemetery outside of Austin, Texas, and I told her I would like to just have my son put me in a sleeping bag, put him, put me on the back seat of his car and bring me to be buried in her cemetery. She said, only if the sleeping bag, not if the sleeping bag is polyester. <laughs> right, right, that's like what I was saying. So, so, so uh, Elva, you need a you need a mushroom sleeping bag or a uh, um, a uh, uh, natural sleeping bag. Um, yeah. Let's see. Tina asks, "Will this recording be available?" Yep, at proaging.com. That'll be there. Um, uh, oh, uh, Terry is asking after the conversion to soil. Where does it go and when? Um, you know, it's done in a couple of months. I said it could be two to three months. It's okay. held at the place, like Recompose would hold it. The family could elect to get a small quantity and they could decide in a bag or a container. And then the rest is donated to land trusts. Oh, I, I know a question that I had earlier on. I, I, I love the... Um, the water memorials i like uh if any of you have all seen the photos of like uh the surfer memorial where everybody goes out and, and they go out to the lineup and they form a big circle and they talk about the their 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 loved one who's passed 
And I, I and a lot of times they'll just throw the ashes right there into the water. But you said something about going three miles out. Um, I know a lot of times, you know, we get our loved one's ashes and we throw them on the ski slope that they wanted, that they liked, or we go over to a lake and we, we, that they loved. Is this um, technically legal or um, something that we could get in trouble for if some authority knew about it? You know, yes and no. The thing is, who's going to see? You see people right. scattering on home plate and all the major ballparks if the deceased was a ball, you know, a baseball fan. It happens. Um, but as far as water, they tell you, you should go out three nautical miles. And any of these companies that have these excursions where you could have your nuclear family come on the boat and have a ceremony on the boat before you're released or scattered, that sort of thing, they'll make sure to go out three miles. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, C. Conley says, are there green, are, how are the green alternatives regulated or monitored to make sure they are doing something that they say they will do, especially important that the person doesn't have family or younger friends that can oversee things. And, and let me tell you folks, I forgot the podcast that I, I was listening to a podcast about, you know, what this one funeral home was doing with um, uh, the bodies. Um, yeah. Sherry, like how, how are these things monitored uh, in this green space? Well, I mean, at the state level, they are, I, I've seen, you know, different fines and everything, not for anything horrendous. It was like lack of paperwork, but they are regulated usually at the state level for compliance. So Okay. So we just got to keep our fingers crossed and these horror stories that we read. I, I actually feel like, you know, the, when the references, I, I think the, uh, the Green Burial Commission is a great place to find reputable um, folks and the resources that you've shared with me are, are, are wonderful here. Um, let's see. Uh, there is a resource for home funerals and green burials. The website's called crossing caring for our own with the death. And uh, okay. Great. Lisa shared a resource there. I love it when y'all share resources and Elva, man, you're sharing a ton of, uh, ton of resources. I know you're in Texas. Um, the, um, oh, a, a pet cemetery near me in Texas allows human cremains to be buried with their beloved pet. Um, wow. That, that's a, gr a great, um, a great thing. Yeah. That's not necessarily a green thing, but because cremation is so prevalent and people's attachments to pets being what they are, um, different states have different rules. Some say you could be buried if you as the human want to be buried in the pet section of the cemetery. Fine. You can't do vice versa. Some don't let, you know, they don't let you. It's um, a lot of what happens or doesn't is really up to the cemetery rules. Not yeah. The state laws, the cemetery rules. So that's why you have to have a conversation. Yeah. And then um, Elva is mentioning also the absolute cheapest and least burdensome method for a family is a whole body donation to science, to a medical school or a paid service. Um, the, um, and again, I don't know if that could be classified as green, but it would be that your body is, is being used for something. But that podcast that I was listening to, uh, you know, after listening to that, you want to, I would do directly to a medical school versus to a, um, uh, a, a paid service, uh, like, a, a perhaps, a, a, a school or a hospital that your doctor went to or something like that. Yeah. I mean, the, it's another thing that you have to start in advance because you have to apply. They don't accept everyone. And you want to have a conversation to say, will they, you know, whose um, responsibility is to get the body to the, you know, research institute or whatever you're donating to? Who covers the cost? What do they do with the body when they're done with their research? And who pays for that? And in what condition 
do you get it back? Those sort of things, because that is also something that varies and you need to check out. Um, this is this is great. You know, these questions. Um, oh, oh, and then um, what Wanda is saying, please, please consider organ donation before arrangements. My husband received a kidney transplant and we will be eternally grateful to the family. Um, yeah. Um, Sherry, tell us a little bit about how that works. Um, uh organ donation and and when we're thinking about things if you want to be an organ donor you also have to register sometimes you could do it when you're getting your license and such <clears throat> but it has to be known when you are you know either going into the hospital if that's where you end up dying or if you die at home it has to be known in advance because your organs have to be kept viable after you know you die so that they could be harvested it can't be a long time after the rest of the body has died that they could take your organs so it's something that you have to um, sign up for and let your loved ones know that that's your wish and what to do with it where it's intended before you go yeah what well, uh, wanda sa says it's very important to let your family know in advance because you can see, again, you're at this mourning process, and then all of a sudden, it's sort of like, uh, whoa, mom wanted her kidneys to go where, you know? Um, and uh, the fact. You this know? is also kind of leads into, you know, who we share our end of life wishes with and our health and medical and financial power of attorney that they're... Um, that they agree with this now the um or that they're going to they're going to serve our wishes and not sort of their perspective of the world i wanted to share this website here i had i'm learning so much today uh elva was talking about these reef balls uh, okay and um uh yeah. check check this out it's basically a pair of college roommates from the university of georgia went diving off the florida keys and saw the deterioration of the keys, and they created these these reef balls that are basically enable a memorial to um uh to 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 help with the reef out there. That's uh, yeah, I call them memorial reefs, but they were reef balls. Um, yeah. One of those slides at sea. Yeah, it's very popular, and like I said, a lot of times you could be part of the launch you know, either on the beach or in a boat and what have you, it's a, a package. And, and I guess in your business, Sherry, I can imagine that like I've, th this just this brief discussion has got me thinking about all things that I never thought about before. Um, I guess like when people come to you, when families and individuals come to you, is a lot of this sort of like, having a conversation about who they are and how they'd like to be remembered and then making them aware of that they don't need to sort of do the traditional fu funeral home and burial and and all the stuff we see on movies or that we've been to that there's alternatives is that uh, whether it be green or otherwise it's just sort of how we want to be remembered yeah, I mean, you know, the very first step is just facing that you're mortal and you will die. I say a whenever death, but it's inevitable. And then you have to do that personal reflection of what's most important to you. What do you really care about in life? And what do you want to be part of your goodbye? And then it goes from there to customize the direction I show them the options for based on what they've said is most important. Um, and Elva has some, uh, once again, Elva, you have three gold stars today for all these great ideas that you're sharing with us. But uh, she she brings up a point about organ and whole body donation. Uh, and, and it's whole body except for the cornea. What, why is the cornea not um, included in a, uh, in a donation? Do you know? I had heard that, but I, I don't recall what the reason is. Uh, okay. 
Um, I had something that I'll I'll look yeah. up um, look about up. that. Maybe Elva knows and she'll jump in. Um, the uh, but um, anyways, this is absolutely amazing. Holy cow, we've gone over an hour. I didn't even realize that we are. Um, uh, I like I said these end of life discussions are so thought provoking. Uh, Sherry, you're an amazing resource. I um. I'll make, I've got your, I've shared your contact. It'll be on the, uh, let's see, the, can you hold the, and, do, oh, okay. So a whole body donation and, but then the cornea, you can donate your cornea separately. Um, okay. That makes sense. Um, okay. Uh, anyways, the recording will be on the website. Sherry's contact will be on the website. Sherry, just email me uh, your your PowerPoint and I'll load that up there too. And uh, I, I'd love to have you come back. This has been a fascinating discussion and um, uh, this is great. There's a lot of things we could do deep dives on that we haven't even touched upon. Anyway. Absolutely. All right. That would be great. Well, everyone, uh, again, thank you, uh, Sherry, and thank you, everybody, for, um, oh, Mary says, I'm a grateful recipient of a corneal transplant. So I, I love it here. We've had the kidney the, and the cornea transplant uh, recipients. Actually, a discussion on transplants would be a great one, I think, based on some of these comments here. So uh, I'll, I'll work on getting something like that done. Um all right, folks. Uh, this is this is great. Everybody have a great great rest of the week. And um, uh, and and Sherry, again, thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Steve. Thank you, everyone, for hanging.